Welcome to the Filmological Society, brought to you by Redacted Media and 6.5 Media. In today's episode, we look at another one of the essentials. Here's your host, Chris Scholes and T.C. DeWitt. All right, welcome to another episode of the Filmological Society. This is the Essentials Show, where we talk about the films that are essential, that you should watch if you are into film or if you want to understand film or you want to understand all the jokes of the Family Guy. These are the movies that you need family to watch. Family Guy, not Simpsons? You want Family Guy instead of Simpsons? I want Family Guy. I want Family Guy. <laughs> so I am I am one of your hosts. I am Chris Scholes. With me, as always, for this show is T.C. DeWitt. Hello, T.C. Howdy, howdy. Um, I wish I could remember some. Uh, hello, my Druig. I think that's a word from Clockwork Orange that uh, makes you my leader. I, I think so. I think so. And I call you my my little Drugs. There you go. Um, <laughs> joining us today, we have a special guest. We have David Geisler. He is one of the co-hosts of another Zelda podcast. Hello, David. How are you? Uh, that's right. Yes. Hello. I oh. am well. Thank you so much for having me on the show. I'm really excited for for this season of Filmological Society. <laughs> yes. Um, and, and David is one of the people that brought our show over to 6.5 Media, which we are so excited about. Um, actually both TC and, and David had a hand in that. So, um, big thank you to both of you, but especially you, David, for saying yes. Well, I'm, I'm pleased we, you know, you, you and I had chatted oh, a long time ago and I was really excited about the idea and we had to figure out some of the logistics because six, five has never, ever taken on a show that had already existed before. Right. And that's very, that's difficult to do, but because I liked what you were doing so much and I really wanted to, I wanted to find a way to make it work. And I think we did. And I'm, I'm really excited. And thank you for also being willing to make a couple small modifications to help this season of Filmological Society kind of fit into what six, five does. I, I, I'm, I think, uh, I think we found a happy little Island there and I'm really I, excited. I think so. I think so. I know, I know <laughs> just talking to TC and talking to Chad, everyone's excited. So, and Julia for that matter too, cause she'll be joining us for some shows in the future. So cool. <laughs> Some All new right, faces. So new faces. Well, one new, one. familiar friends. Familiar friends. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Right. Yes. Well, so, I mean, we're, to we're, a lot of people, if if I may, Chris, a lot of people. Yeah. They might be finding this season first if they're finding it through some of the other six five shows or anything. So there's an incredible backlog out there of of like seventy four, seventy five episodes. Yeah. And they might be finding the show through this season first, and they can get to all those episodes over on iTunes or Apple Podcasts and Google Podcasts and Spotify and all that. The back, the back catalog. It's so back it, catalog. Yeah. yeah, and there's there's various types of film analysis, film conversation that happens in each episode of the Filmological Society. Uh, yes. When you pitched it to me, Schulze, as you and Chad doing it, it was oh, we're gonna do the. The, the hundred comedies according to the BBC. I was like, cool. Yep. And then episode one is like an Oscars conversation from the year it came out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you really threw yeah. the numbers off real quick. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it really did. Um, Cause then, yeah, about uh, 25 or so in, then I'm like, I want to do something else. And uh, so, you know, there, there's a series in the, sh- in, uh, in the series that is, you know, you haven't seen what it's called. Like, so that yeah. film that you oh, love this and your my, friends have never seen it before. <laughs> this is one of my uh, favorites. Like, I'm, I, if I may, the, you haven't seen yeah. what is typically you, me, and Julia. So Schulze, Julia, and I. And mm-hmm. it'll be like, Julia's like, Officer and a Gentleman. Great, classic Academy Award winning movie. I've never seen it. It's part of pop culture. Let's watch it. And then I'll pick like Spirited Away, one of the finest pieces of animation in the past two two decades. Great. And then Schulze picks... Transylvania six five thousand. Yep. That's <laughs> yeah. Right. Exactly. That's the that's the exact amount of silence that should follow that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I I also picked coming to America. Yes, it's true, but I I think it's funny that Julia and I are like, oh, these award uh, win uh, winning <laughs> films and these these lauded films. And you're like, has anyone seen Spies Like Us? <laughs> <laughs> i love it no it's great it's um, great I, it's it's film it's conversation fun. And, it's yeah. fun and you know get to watch all sorts of films and and then this series um i i love this it. series this has been the essential line so it started with you know we we talked about movies we've never seen before and some of them were films that are are considered classics like seven samurai right. was a film that i had never seen before i've heard it referenced millions of times mm-hmm. now it's it's 
one of the top films I've ever seen in my life. It is amazing. Yeah. And I'm glad. Incredible. Metropolis was another one. Rebel Without a Cause. Just these classic pieces of essential cinema that as cinephiles we should have seen. And and it sort of spawned off though you haven't seen what, but it was more about like, let's we're not talking about Lord of the Rings here, which don't get me wrong, Lord of the Rings is very important to cinema, modern cinema, but these are the classics. These are the 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 older films that you see studied in school that we lie our way <laughs> through conversations. Oh yeah, of course I've seen because <laughs> <laughs> it's so ingrained in pop culture, but to yeah. actually sit down and watch them, that's where this this collection came from. So that's that's what this show is. This is is part of that series, the Essential series. And today, uh, the three of us are going to be talking about 1971's A Clockwork Orange. Mm-hmm. Stanley so, Kubrick. Stanley Kubrick. So, TC, is it? Had you seen this film before? I have not. This was a first time view for me. I, okay. It was definitely one that I've been aware of. I could tell you, I could identify Alex Malcolm McDowell's character just by seeing him. Uh, you would say, funny enough, you'd mentioned Family Guy, and I said Simpsons. The first time I was aware of Clockwork Orange is there's a Treehouse of Horror where yes. Bart is Alex, and I yeah. didn't get it when it aired or when I saw it on reruns or whatever. And it was it took some looking at the trivia to go. Bart is dressed as Alex from A Clockwork Orange. I'm like, oh, okay, cool, cool. Uh, but I I had never seen it, and I uh, <laughs> I had things to say about it now. Okay. What what about you, David? Had you seen this film before? I have things to say as well. I'm coming hot off this film. I oh. I watched it. Well, I I watched it organically almost exactly 20 years ago when okay. when I was in film school 20 years ago, um, the first time around, and I I had thoughts then, which I'll speak about in a little in a little bit here as we get into the conversation. And then I hadn't seen the film, you know, until today. I I finished. At, as of this recording, I finished the film about an hour and 10 minutes ago. I timed it okay. out because I had just enough time to get it in my schedule today. Took the afternoon off kind of thing and watched it. So I, I was scribbling a bunch of notes down. I've got a lot in my head. But I also have this, because I just saw it, I have a lot of chaotic energy in my head and mm-hmm. thoughts about this film. So I'm <laughs> excited to talk about it. It may not be fully realized, but there's a lot going on. I will say that my thoughts about the film when I was a 20 year old are almost inverse to my thoughts about the film as a 40 year old. Interesting. Yeah. That was, that, as I was watching it, I, I was con- like, not consciously, but I became aware that I was responding to scenes and acts and struck the structure of the film and what was being talked about in almost an inverse way as how I remembered it from 20 years ago. So there it is. That, do- that wow. doesn't surprise me because in watching it, I could see why this is a triumphant anarchist youthful film to someone of a younger mindset of like a less mature yeah. mindset, but also being older myself and looking at, I, I'm, an, I'm looking at as an, a much more adult perspective and going, Oh, come on, you goddamn kid. <laughs> 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 well, yes, yes. There was some of that. Chris, how about you? May I ask you, I, this, have you seen it before? I had seen bits and pieces, but I had never had seen the whole thing. And I, 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 had, I, when I was in film school, we would watch, you know, there'd be like tidbits of it that would be brought up. But obviously they're, they're not bringing up the entire thing. This is not a film that we watch the entire thing of. But um, not a lot of boobs in the movies you watched in film school. Oh, oh there, there were plenty. There were plenty. <laughs> I took uh, one semester Sorry, was clarify. all about the horror, <laughs> the horror genre. Lots of um, boobs. So <laughs> lots of boobs there. Uh, but um, uh, yeah. So and, and um, had, had either of you read the book? No, no, I, no, I, I attempted to, book. I tried to. Oh yeah. Well, like, uh, wait, when, like a few years ago, TC? No, like or this is after in, watching. In co- yeah. I just uh, <laughs> forget it. No, in college, when I was really starting to develop my, my taste in cinema, uh, being aware that this was a classic film based on a classic piece of literature, I attempted to read the book and the book comes with a freaking dictionary to, to yeah. translate the language. And you hear a lot of the language in the narration from Alex and in how they speak uh, just terminology, but not nearly as much as the book, which is almost like it is reading a different language at first. And so I, I attempted to a, read it. It was a constructed language. That was a built language yeah. by the author. Yeah. But yeah a mix of Russian and English and, and it's like NADSAT. Mm-hmm. Fa- NADSAT. Fascinating, but 
too difficult for me to commit to. So, you well, know, <laughs> maybe 20 I, pages. I'm like, I'm done. <laughs> I, I did do some research. So we'll talk about some of the key things that either Kubrick changed from the book or left out. There wasn't cool. much. Yeah, this is considered one of the best adaptations because uh, Kubrick, a lot of the dialogue that he wrote in the script was pulled directly from the book. So no changing it at all. Nice. Um, you know, something I something I learned about back in film school when this was the reason I watched it in film school is because it was discussed in one of my classes and it was, you know, we watched mm -hmm. it for that reason. So I had a I was informed a little bit about the film that first time around. And I recall that part of the conversation was that apparently initially uh, Kubrick did not like the book at all, a lot largely for that language. He was like, "What? what is this? I'm not into it. Um, but he kind of came around to it. So much so that they basically did start to try to make the film exactly like the book. Mm -hmm. And also, wasn't it originally called a different what they weren't going to use the Clockwork Orange title? Chris, maybe you have this in your notes, but it was going to be called whatever the name of the test is that he goes through mm -hmm. is what the original mm -hmm. screenplay was. But as the scenes got closer and closer to the book, as Kubrick got more and more comfortable with the book, they ended up deciding they should st stick with the same title and everything. Smart, smart. And and. So Kubrick is known to be a very demanding director. Yeah. He used film and he would often do 40, 50, 60 takes on film, which Jesus. is <laughs> expensive, uh, expensive and demanding. Uh, this was his shortest film that he ever made <laughs> like for, this, for filming, like, oh, the, like the, the time the, it the, took for him to film yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I see. OK. okay. Yeah. There were a few scenes, which we'll talk about the scenes, that um, he didn't do his, uh, you know, characteristic 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 takes. Another one. See. Another one. I, I'm pretty sure you could guess what scenes those were. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, um, you know, I will say, too, I know that another thing that we were talking about 20 years ago, which I kind of remember – um, was that this, I think this is the film that he made right after, if not shortly after 2001 mm -hmm. and 2001 cost a ton of money. So when he made Clockwork Orange, he wanted to make it fast and cheap, so to speak <laughs> for him. Yeah. Well, and he had also yeah. failed. He was trying to create a believe a Napoleon Bona Bonaparte film. Oh, and, um, so that's where his interest was. Like he was focused on that film mm -hmm. and he had no interest in Clockwork Orange because of that film. His wife read the book and said, you need to make this. And that's kind of what got him to do it because the Napoleon film fell apart. And he, and I, I think it was because of some problems with the studios and other things. So he probably connected with Alex a little bit there in the beginning of uh, that chaotic, anarchic type of thing and and wanted to kind of stick the stick the thumb at uh, at the studio and just, mm. you know paint them kind of in a bad picture perhaps perhaps yeah i can see that it's it's interesting so so this film yeah malcolm mcdowell uh stars in it and this is the only film i can think of him that he doesn't have like white hair right yeah <laughs> like, otherwise like like you see him i hear his voice i'm expecting that white hair because he got white hair early and mm -hmm. that's like stuck with him it's his it's um, his trademark well yeah. the character <laughs> The character of Alex is like 21 or 20 or something in the film. I'm sure McDowell was a little older than that, he was but like still 20, pretty young. I think so. It was He was supposed to be 17 in the beginning. And then oh, I, they I aged him up from the book. In the book, he's mm -hmm. 15. Mm -hmm. So oof. he's he's 17. Oof, but boof. And then, and then at the end of the film, he's 19 because he's two years in prison. Mm -hmm. But he was, Malcolm McDowell was 25 or 26 at the time. Oh, man. Oh, okay, so, okay. I, is just ta taking this movie as a whole and imagining a 15, 17 year old doing everything that happens in here because Malcolm McDowell did look late twenties and he did not strike me yeah. as a teenager. Um, not often when actually when he was like in his suit and looking, looking respectable, he actually looked youthful. But when he was Alex, when he was freaking out, when he was doing the yeah. things he was doing, he looked like a man. He didn't look like, a, a rebellious kid. Um, not that I want to yeah, see a 17 true. year old kid do the things that are, what's Timothy Chalamet do it. Let's remake a clockwork orange. Ready? Everybody. Chalamet. Yeah. <laughs> no, do not remake this movie. 
Um, so yeah, so let's talk a little bit about the plot, just because uh, I think it's it's good to talk about the plot. There are clear three acts in this film, and with the first act being um, Alex and his gang mm-hmm. in in the future. I think it's I think the movie, the timeline, is supposed to be like in the nineties, in the nineteen nineties. But it so is film was the made future. In from the sixties or whatever. Yeah, from the sixties. So it's a futuristic film. Um, takes place in the 90s in London and he and his gang they they hang out at a uh, at the uh, Korova milk bar <laughs> where they get some drugged milk uh, that some they of that super milk draw directly milk, milk from milk plus yeah milk plus yeah there you go yeah. draw directly oh. from a, uh, a, a a plastic bosom <laughs> Of uh, these these, these uh, mannequins, I guess, of naked women all over the place in this bar, all uh, like, over this movie because they're all that, filled with all over the movie. Yeah, but this the bar act, especially the first act of this movie, as you said, it's broken up nicely into three pieces. That first act movie is just boobs, dongs, and it's just sexual deviance just on every frame. Yeah. I have I have no problem with nudity in film. Nudity in films. I was offended by the first act of this film. I gotta say. <laughs> Yeah, I, that, I, that that goes to the the youthful mindset versus the adult mindset where yeah. I could I understand why this was such a uh, successful film in certain circles when it came out, that it was this yeah. highly sought after VHS movie because it's it is youthful rebellion, anarchy, ah, boobs, tits, sex, you know, all this horrible deviance. Yeah, as an adult, I'm looking at it just uncomfortable. I, it's every now and then you watch a movie, and I'm like, I hope no one walks into the room while I'm in the middle of one of these scenes. I felt that way tonight. Yeah, I felt that way tonight as I was watching it. I kept checking over my shoulder. I was like, "Geez, I hope I hope my girlfriend doesn't walk in and just see me looking at this." What this are is, you doing? But anyway, anyways. Yeah. Sorry, Chris. Continue. Yeah. <laughs> well, I was just going to get just a little bit into some of the deviants that are shown on film. Um, so they beat up another gang pretty decisively. They, you know, rape. They they, they break they into beat a up house. That gang. They beat up that gang in under the guise of like trying to protect the woman that that gang's trying to he, rape. Right. right. And and then they just go right around and go and reverse the action. And I was just like, I don't, I can't, I can't be rooting for anybody here. It's, it's right. difficult. <laughs> yeah. We'll get into that. I want to. I want to talk about yeah. the anti-hero motif. But um, yeah, they well they beat up a homeless guy that's just singing, singing away in a nice. Irishy way, I guess. I thought he was Irish. I don't know if he was Irish, but he sounded Irish. He was very Irish. Um, yeah. yeah. And then and then they go to they seal a car. They mm-hmm. uh, run a bunch of cars off the road. They uh, go to a, the rich neighborhood. They find a house. They lie break about in. why they want to get in. Break in. Uh, they beat the husband, the writer. Into uh, into paralysis. Into paralysis. They rape we later. Yeah, they rape his wife, who we learn later that basically killed her. Yeah, fortunately, the scene ends before that starts. Yeah, yeah. And then um, he he fakes. Uh, he doesn't want to go to school, so he fakes being yep. sick. There's being a, sick. A, a social worker essentially who comes to like talk to him, who is also a deviant of his own of uh, on his own accord. Yeah. Uh, uh, they tried to. Uh, Alex's crony tries to usurp his power, uh, yep. but oh, then yeah. well, it's like this is yeah. after he picked up two women at the, oh, at that's the right. record store. Yeah. Has, and has a, nice has sex. a sped up twenty eight minutes. So that was a twenty eight minute single shot <laughs> of just Alex having sex. That with was sped up in real life. That, wow. Yeah, that, that's what they shot in real life. Wow! And then and they I sped it up. It did. It was played with classical music. Um, yeah. And it the the acts that those three characters were doing in the bedroom, what it was, even though it was sped up, it kind of did sync up with the music. Weirdly yeah. so. I thought yeah. to myself, yeah. And you know, I you know how it is. Like whenever you shoot a music video, you play the music faster and you shoot at a a higher frame rate so that everything when it's played back, it's played in slow motion and the mm-hmm. musicians look super cool because they're all <laughs> in slow motion, but they're still singing at a normal speed. I thought to myself, did these three actors have to listen to like a a a super slowed down version, like <laughs> trying to sync up their point to line up with this song. If it was like reversed and I, to, to Kubrick's credit, I wouldn't put it past him. Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't either. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah. Uh, and and the fact that it was a single take, like mm -hmm. a, a single shot, like that's a 28, 28 minutes of film mm -hmm. to get that one. Yeah, scene. 28 minutes that they shot the they shot film. Now, the camera isn't moving Without or anything. That. It's mostly just those three actors go live yep. in that space with some direction. But nevertheless, that's a long time. Oof. Yeah. Um, well. And then, yeah, then they try to get usurped of power. And, and then they uh, try to do the thing. they try to do it again. The uh, the knock on the yeah, door. The old, the old in and out, in and out. Mm -hmm. uh, but Which Alex is, uh, is he's trapped by he's tricked by his cronies and caught by the police for yep. trying to attack and rape another person. Well, and as a matter of fact, night, they go at it again. Kill yeah, her. he he kills her. He kills her with a with a giant penis statue. <laughs> Yikes! No. It's art, yeah. guys. This is art. Well, it's and that that is something that uh, if we have time, we'll get into as well. Just that you know, art being. Um, you know, sex and and, you know, just kind of like how art can uh, can both be good and bad in that sense. Um, well, I think it's, like the, it's art. Yeah. The interpretation of it. Yeah. Yes. Like, yes. Uh, so then so we get into act two, which is prison. So I don't, I don't know, David, do you want to touch on this one at all since it's fresh in well, your I, mind? Uh, yeah, I could, maybe I can a little bit because for me, I, I remember the first time I, I was, I was uncomfortable with the first act both times I saw the film and, and, I, and you're supposed to be, it's obvious you're supposed yeah. to be, I think. Mm -hmm. Actually, oh. if I may do a little bit of an offshoot for just a second, the thing that made me most uncomfortable with the first act is that there's a couple times where the shots linger in ways where it is, it does become voyeuristic and not to the credit of the victims. And that's yeah. tremendously disturbing to the point mm -hmm. where I started th thinking, like, is Kubrick perving out here? What is going on? There, there are shots that are not necessarily feeding the story. But with all that said, obviously, these 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 images are there to disrupt you. And that I get yeah. that. I get that. That's totally cool. Um, so I do remember that uh, when I saw it in film school, when the second act came in, I started it started slowing down for me. I started, you know, getting not lost, but thinking like, geez, Louise, where are we going now? Um, but this time when we, when he, when he gets, when he is, when our main character is brought into the prison and is, you know, asked to take his personal belongings and strip down and all that stuff. I leaned in. I was like, Oh, now it's getting good. <laughs> He's been caught. <laughs> I was like, what will happen? What will happen next? My 40 year old brain was like, Ooh, subtlety. Interesting. What, you know, what does this all mean? <laughs> Well, this Wait. the the second act is the stuff that people know without knowing it. That this is where the yeah. eyes being propped open and yep. the eye drops in the eye. Th that's like the most iconic image from this film is him being forced to watch what he's watching, and, and I think it's, that's what it's people, a meme. It's a meme. It is now. A meme. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's well, true. It, so it basically, this is Alex. The second act is Alex's journey through prison, and he finds a way out he finds a way out about an experimental procedure of which he doesn't, he doesn't know what it is. He's just kind he, he, he makes friends with the, the, the priest or the reverend or whatever it is yeah. in the, in the prison. He's obviously doing it to manipulate and try to suck up and just try to get back out into the world. Mm -hmm. He's, he's, pu he's pulling the act off quite well through most of the second act so much so that when he does quote unquote convert to being a good person, you kind of still wonder, is he still pulling the act? You know what mm -hmm. I mean? It's, yeah. It was a, it's a really good performance by McDowell. But nevertheless, it's clat like the second act is classic kid in prison trying to outsmart the guards by being super nice, trying to, you know, trying to be nice once they're in the principal's office just to get back out on the playground. And he learns about a procedure and one thing leads to another. And um, he becomes the first um, I almost said victim, but the first first <laughs> no. subject in this experimental procedure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's um, I I I. I you know, this took some some thinking about it after, but you, you know, Act One is is you know that embraces the anarchy of choice, where there's no you know they have no guidelines, they do whatever they want. Act Two is all about that strict control and structure. Mm -hmm. So you have the okay. two opposing, and 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 that really is what the theme of the movie is about. It's about choice versus uh, uh, structure, order versus choice. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because then Act Three, you kind of get a mix of the two, right? It's the it's the release from prison. Yeah. yeah, yeah, he's released from prison, oh, and and he now has to answer 
to a lot because it, it, we revisit a lot of the same places, same mm-hmm. people that we did mm-hmm. in the beginning. He, he meets up with some of his droogs again. Which he meets, if, the, he, he meets up with his droogs who are now police officers two years after officers, he went to prison, yes. yeah. which struck me as one of the more mm, accurate things of the topical. modern era that <laughs> topical, know. just that, no. that not every time, because I certainly have a uh, policeman in my life who I love and cherish and, and respect for what they've done. But it does seem a bit of a trope or cliche that sometimes the bullies and the wrong the wrong type of person is put into a position of power, uh, like yeah. a police officer, or it where it's embraces like embraces that, yeah, wants yeah. that, yeah. And, and, I, and I don't mean this, that it, yeah. it's not intended to be an indictment of all police officers being bad, but it's an indictment of those police officers who were clearly bullies and unhinged before they became cops. And like, oh, great, now they're the law, and they nearly drown him to death in a long, continuous shot that had me wondering if they had an air tube. For Malcolm McDowell yes. in that thing, yeah, I wondered it too. Mal- he was down. He was down there for a minute or two or more. It yeah. was a single shot. But I do want to make a point about that. The third act, we basically travel back through the first act, kind of yeah. beat for beat. We go visit the old. We accidentally go visit the homeless guy again. Mm-hmm. He v- sees his his droogs or, or or whatever. His yeah, parents. I think it is droog. I think you're right. Yeah. Um, we end up going back to the house where the, that that uh, that sexual assault o- occurred. And um, we don't go back to the cat lady, but but more happens. But anyway, yeah. I think the point is, is what we realize is that he, um, his real punishment is in the third act, not the second act is kind yes. of what happens, is what yep. we learn. He has to really face his consequences in the third act. He's gone through the experimental scientific, basically torture, so that whenever he thinks about bad things, he feels this torturous feeling. <laughs> Um, I actually thought that the most potent I thought the most potent line in the film was weirdly from the reverend about halfway through the second act where he's kind of giving our main character the, the classic religious stuff that you hear of like oh what makes a man all, all that and so it didn't hit me at first but he said one line where it's like it's if a, a, a man in other words a person um, if they can make choice if they have a choice in the matter if they have if they shoot good I think he said you have to choose to be good or good must be chosen. It was something like that. I don't yeah. know if you guys recall. You can't yes. I think Force that's it. almost the theme of the whole film right there in that line. Yeah. Does our character, um, our main character, does he, is he choosing any of this? What is he choosing? What isn't he choosing? And um, I do want to say one more thing about the police officers that I thought about. Those two hooligans that used to be in the gang with our main character are now police. They do a terrible thing to him Mm -hmm. but i don't want to give him the benefit of the doubt but we don't necessarily know that they were bad as police officers sure (laughs) that technically wasn't an act as a police officer that was them kind of still having this inner monster in them Mm -hmm. kind of going back to their old boss who abused them and they're re bringing war but when they initially went up to the old man group i think that you know it's a little bit of a it's a little bit of a an about face where you see these two cops come up and as an audience member, you're supposed to go, okay, here we go. We're going to be okay. Mm -hmm. And then the camera reverses on the close up, and you see it's these two, it's the two guys that, that he basically attacked in the first act that were part of his gang. Um, I'm not going to defend them at all, but I just want to make that point. Technically Mm -hmm. that the act of violence they did, I mean, as responsible police officers, they should know better, but Mm -hmm. anyway, (laughs) that, that is a good point. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, (laughs) So we'll just end the uh, the third act. So um, he is he is uh, drugged by the writer who is now in a wheelchair, who also is trying to use him to as a symbol of the uh, state's overreach mm-hmm. of, you know, treating people badly. But then he realizes that this is the the person who put him in a wheelchair, who killed his wife. And uh, by the way, did you do you know who that was? That was that was uh, the 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 man helper, the caretaker, the buffer. I, I think we I think we all do these days. I, Wait, I, you, I, say you don't. Dar- it was Darth Vader. That was right. David Prowse. Yes. Yep. I didn't know that. That's incredible. Yeah. No, I didn't know oh that. God. Super cool. Wow. That's that's a cool yeah. bit of trivia. Nice. Man, so he was, um, he was jacked like he was buff. Yeah, I love that he's wearing yeah. the same outfit as the wife used to wear that he's yes. he has the same dialogue. Who could that be at the door? I'll check. Like, I think that was a nice little that yeah. Kubrick has a very weird 
dark, uncomfortable sense of humor. And it's moments like that where it's like, yeah. oh, this is your manservant now wearing his Speedo <laughs> and answering the door just like your wife. Like, I can make some assumptions of what's happening here. And that's funny. Yeah. Um, so in the house, so they they drug him. Uh, they lock him up in a room and they torture him with uh, Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, which is his favorite. But because be. <laughs> because of the programming that he went through in prison, it now makes him sick. Yeah. And so yeah, we he, should point out we should point out that what happened was during his torture, when basically he was subjected to horrible, violent imagery and he was forced to watch it. The idea, you know, the idea is I had a friend once who loved Dilly bars at Dairy Queen Dilly bars. And um, this friend was was dealing with their their um, an, a weight issue uh, of themselves. And they wanted to make a certain choice about not eating so many sweets. And so they did the thing where they like one day got 10 Dilly bars and just ate them until they, was, they were disgusted by it. Wow. And 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 I mean, it's a bit of a silly story. But for for this friend, this was this was almost 15 years ago. For this friend, allegedly at work, they didn't want Dilly bars ever again in their life. They had they had exhausted the the the, the any savoriness of it, mm-hmm. and they were able to kind of get it out of their system. So, with that as a little bit of a weird analogy, the idea was: well, this our our main character loves loves or gets a high off of violence and violent acts. We're gonna force them to overdose on these things, and also give them medicine to make them physically sick, so that they associate. They associate this torturous experience with those th- those images. Mm. What and and it basically works. One thing that was there was an overlook is that the somewhere ba- not on screen, somewhere back in the labs of the scientists and doctors who were putting these images, <laughs> these films of horrible images together, they put classical music as the audio tracked over some of this stuff yeah and it just so happens that at a certain point i think it's towards the end of day two of uh, allegedly 14 days but at the end of day two it just so happens that our main character's favorite song um by beethoven it's the ninth it's ninth we've said it already this episode a few times beethoven's ninth is in the background music (laughs) and he gets very very upset about this he's even even begs them no this is sacrilege how could you possibly put this beautiful music (laughs) to such horrible imagery Mm -hmm. and so a byproduct an accident a byproduct of that is that not only does do violent acts make him sick in the third act but accidentally listening to this one song also executes a trigger which makes him very very sick and when our the man who was assaulted man and wife were assaulted in the first act when they are revisited by this character in the second act w- with David Prowse um our that man who was assaulted learns of this quirky feature mm-hmm. it just yeah. comes up in conversation he learns that this song will also equal the torture on our main character and at that point that man who, who the victim in the third act chooses to attack back by using that song yeah yeah and- which causes Alex to jump out of the window to try to commit suicide, which right. if if successful, then the the writer, the man in the wheelchair could still use him as a symbol against the state. So he that's the angle that he was going for. Alex was just a tool, basically, mm-hmm. for for right. both sides. Right. Uh-huh. Alex ends up in the hospital with casts on his entire body, basically. And tells, as he's the narrator, he tells us that he is cured. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Meaning he's oh, back to where film. he was in Act 1. Yeah. Well, it's also interesting is that after he jumps out of the window halfway through Act 3 and he returns to this hospital, he's his state, his capacity isn't that much different than when he was straightjacketed up back in the, uh, in the yeah. prison. In the same yeah. he, can't, he can't even move his head. There's a scene at the end. Where he literally needs someone to feed him because he can't. He has so so little agency, physical agency. <laughs> yeah, smiling after each bite comes in. More people. Yeah. yeah. So I think this is a good time for us to take a quick break for some sponsors. Ooh, wait. <laughs> Oh, I wonder if there's going to be a 6-5 ad in, in, coming up in just a second. I mean, not a 6-5 ad. A studio demands it ad. <laughs> oh, you may hear my voice again in a moment. That's cool. <laughs> it's going to happen. I have okay. a feeling it's going to happen. Okay. 
Hey, this is TC. And this is Jim from the Studio Demands It podcast. Where every episode we take a demand from a hypothetical studio. Which could be you. And challenge ourselves to conceptualize, pitch, and craft a film based on the stipulations. Or the demands. We are given. We talk about movies all the time. Particularly, we complain about the choices made in the films we've seen. We're nerds like that. And, of course, like any good nerd does, we automatically assume that we could do better. Even with the demands and restrictions that clearly must have been put on by a production. So head on over to studiodemandsit.com and listen to our previous library of episodes. Our library of previous episodes. Our precious library, Jim. <laughs> our library of precious episodes. <laughs> You're a pirate Smeagol. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. So head on over to studiodemandsit.com to listen to our library of episodes. And submit your demand for a future episode, too. So go do that. Okay, bye. Okay, end of ad. Hi, I'm Ryan. And I'm Mike. And, and we, we are, are brothers-in-law. Brothers we both love beer and are amateur home brewers. Wait, so does that make us... Brothers-in-law? <laughs> I believe so. Every episode, we will talk about aspects of beer and home brewing. But nothing super technical because we're learning this too. So join us as we sit down together and dive into something beer-related. Whether it's a little field research, tasting a certain beer style, or beers from a specific brewery, Talk about our experiences brewing beer at home, including our own solo brews, as well as themed competitions we'll set up along the way. We will also talk about some of our favorite aspects of brewing, like hops, extra ingredients, building our brew cave, and more. And of course, our own misadventures that have happened along the way. So, if you like beer, are home brewing already, or if you have an interest in home brewing and don't know where to start, join us on Brewers in Law Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And make sure to follow us on Twitter at Brewers in Law and check out our website, BrewersInLaw.com. Cheers. Cheers. All right. So now that we've uh, seen that, let me just point out the two major differences between the book. And the movie, there are a, a, a handful of them. I, I wouldn't say it's, it's not like a, a Lord of the Rings where they're, you know, they add, you know, or The Hobbit, where they basically add, you know, two and a half films of content that weren't <laughs> actually in the book to it. Mm. So the, the, there's just a couple of things, couple of details that were um, missed. So um, the the first one, and we talked about this already, Alex in the book is 15. Mm. He still right. picks up the two girls. In the record store, the difference is that the two girls are 10. Whoa. Th- I, can't, I can't. I can't. And she drugs and rapes them. Oh, my God. Okay. Not. So Kubrick decided. Yeah. You know what? Let's not do that. Let's make everyone the same age and make Jesus. it I'm offended. I'm offended hearing that right now. Yeah. <laughs> God. Yeah. Um, the second, and this is probably the more significant difference. So when this book was published, there is, um, I, I, I think, so I, I think there's like 21 chapters. So each, each act is, uh, as a clean seven chapters per act. So there's mm-hmm. 21 oh, chapters total. There is a 22nd chapter though. Hmm. In the United States, which is where the, the, book that Kubrick had uh, somebody decided we don't like that 22nd chapter so we're going to leave that out oh okay what was the 22nd chapter in the 22nd chapter Alex at the ripe old age of 18 <laughs> um, he sees the errors of his ways he he's like I, I just Ooh. can't do this anymore he sees the uh, another one of his drugs who has grown up and is married with kids, and he's like, "That's I. I need to do that." So mm-hmm. there's a little bit of like a redemption at the end. There's a God, I was waiting of, for you to say some horrible twist in the end. No, like no. <laughs> the final chapter is no. I, I started out with the bad. Oh God, go into the good. <laughs> so, so because that wasn't the version that Kubrick had, and even though he became aware of that, mm-hmm. he didn't want to include that part in his film. Gotcha. I see. Hmm. 
I, well, I, you know, if if to speak to that choice, this idea that I, I mentioned this in the first act here, in the first half of this episode, that the way Malcolm McDowell chooses to perform the the lead character, I forgot his name. Is it Alex? Alex. 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 Okay, thank you. Uh, the way he chooses to perform Alex, you and, and because McDowell has those glassy blue eyes that just pierce everything and anything, yeah. you never know if he's, forgive me, but like crazy behind them or not, mm-hmm. you know? Um and so I like this idea that maybe through the entire third act, we're still left guessing where is this guy's head? Has he gone? Has he reverted to his state from the first act? Is he some mutated version of the of of this new version of himself? Who is he by the end of this film? And so maybe Kubrick wanted to kind of keep that thought Am- process happening. That ambiguity yeah. being maintained. Yeah. yeah, that's that's a good assumption there, because there certainly is an ambiguity in how this ends. I think even just speaking of David, you have seen this in your twenties and I've seen it in your forties, having two different perceptions mm-hmm. of it. Certainly that happens with any movie that you're going to watch over time, but something that is so championed or was championed as this youthful anarchist, uh, anti-hero, like, yay, Alex, he's awesome. Look at it. Damn the man. <laughs> and the more mature mind can right. look at and go, this kid's, this is a horrible, horrible human being. Uh, yeah. Did he become that way because of the system or did he just choose to be that way? I, that's the, yeah. the ambiguity that's left in the end. Well, so so a question I have for you two is, is Alex a sympathetic villain? I, no, I, I um, don't find him sympathetic. Yeah, I think there is absolutely nothing awesome about this character. I think his journey is valid. I think his story is valid. Mm-hmm. Um, there might be moments where he shows a little bit of there's a little bit of humanity in the third act when he realizes he has to leave home or there's nothing there for him. He realizes his snake is dead. He starts to cry a little bit in, in a way that I felt was authentic. Mm-hmm. I thought that performance, I thought that was an authentic cry. I don't think that was manipulation to try to manipulate his family to stay at the house or anything that felt kind of real. There's a few other times in the third act where it does seem like he might be having some genuine um, non sociopathic reactions. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, um, but it's light. So yeah. when when did it did did he draw any and I'll share my thoughts too but did he draw any sympathy mm-hmm. or any, any any feelings for you like when he was trapped up in that bedroom and now the 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 writer was the one torturing him basically I like, I, I understand why yes you could perceive it that way that okay he's yeah. finally seen the error of his ways and his only choice he just wants to die like and. That is is a, a commentary and and on the system that tried to reform him that yeah. it leads to a point of someone who's been reformed that their only way out is to kill themselves. You can get that seen through something like Shawshank Redemption very, very eloquently on screen. I see it just as further proof of his cowardice and his ignorance and his immaturity that, oh, the only option here, I've, I faked my way through reform. I got out. I, I don't want to have this visceral response to when I hear A, B, or C, A, B, or C, violence and sexuality messes with me, uh, to see his only option being I'm going to jump out this window and kill him, kill myself. No. I I don't feel sympathy towards him. And he even tries to – he kind of justifies it in a playful way. He's like, yeah, quick – you know, maybe a bit of pain, crack to the head, and I get to sleep forever. Yeah. And um, it didn't feel glib, but it did not feel – I'm sincere. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, this is a yeah. great – people talk about him like an anti-hero and shows yeah. know you want to discuss him as an anti-hero. But I say we can, we can go ahead. just from my my nerdy comic book mind, I'm like this is the backstory to a guy who needs to be beat up by Batman. <laughs> like this is a super <laughs> villain's origin story. The, the, um, a, a, non, yeah, please. a non-sympathetic because I think a lot of like villain stories written now – Mm-hmm. It's like you, you they try to write them so you understand why oh, the villain no, like, is the yeah, way they are. That's why they're so evil. You, no. you don't have this raw evil, I guess. Like like I yeah. I yeah, I would agree with I I felt no sympathy. I you know, I mean, if anything, I'm still sympathizing with that writer who's in mm-hmm. a wheelchair now who lost his wife to yes. this guy. I um, agree. And he he way overacts that third act. That writer, <laughs> <laughs> his his sweat pores are acting in those scenes. But but nevertheless, I was still sympathizing with the writer. Um, yeah. um, even if he has his own agenda, so, you know. I, actually, this makes me think of something. I kind of wanted to bring this up. 
I don't even know if we need to like our quote unquote main character. No, I think Alex is our main character, but I think Alex might be a vehicle through a different story, a different journey. I don't know if our, if the audience's journey needs to necessarily be with Alex. I think Alex might be taking us through these other experiences to examine other things, to examine um, yes. how the government deals with stuff, to, to examine how, you know, for example, it really clicked for me at the end, the final scene in the third act when the the new politician that had um, decided to try out the the essentially torturous experiment in act two, um, mm-hmm. when he comes in in act three and speaks to Alex and, and is manipulating him into being friends and and making Alex look good and making sure he and our pol- politicians making sure that he's getting all the appropriate photographs Smile. taken. Smile for with the camera. Alex, thumbs up. Yeah. Thumbs yeah. Up. All of that. I realized I said I thought to myself, oh, I don't think this story is about Alex. I think this story is about. I mean, I think this story is about the society that's being presented to us and and the different ways that people are dealing with things, even the way the writer deals with these things. So if Alex is the problem, if Alex is a, all things considered, let's just say for the sake of this conversation, a force of nature, something Mm -hmm. that may or may not be changed, Mm -hmm. it's it's also interesting to to decide if he's changed or not. That is interesting. But if we're not going there and, and he is a force of nature, then what's interesting is how all these other people respond and react to, um, how they affect him. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah con- conceptually yeah. that you're yeah you're touching on it i think what the the purpose behind this film can be looked at like what what we're supposed to get from this film is not do not root for alex rooting for alex is like rooting for tyler durden you got you are hearing and seeing the wrong stuff if you watch this <laughs> and think oh man alex is awesome no that's that's not the point. I, I really do think it is a dissection of prison reform and psychological re- like psychiatry and and so just how people are taken kids are taken off the street, put through a system and then put back on the street and how they are not fixed. They are just broken differently by the end of it. And that was true in yeah. 71 when this came out in the when this book was written before that and it's 62. true now 62 yeah. and it's true now where the system the system is much more interested in having successes they can show off. A, a minister agent yes. shaking hands with, look how good we did. Smile for the camera without actually yeah. succeeding. It's all the perception of success. And and Alex is a victim of that as much as everyone's a victim of him as a force of, it, force of nature. Dude, I was just going to say that. I was just going to say, Alex, the vic- the, if he's a victim of anything, it's that. And yes, I, I completely agree, TC. <laughs> and you and know, yet um, – I was going to say, and yet he is our, he is our storyteller. Mm-hmm. This is storyteller. all through his narration. So um, I, I, I was uh, uh, catching a lot of like Catcher in the Rye vibes. Oh, uh, you know where you have a very unreliable narrator oh, telling I was a story. About that too, yeah. And, and yeah, is he victimizing himself through the narrative? Yeah, like like that's that's the picture that we're being presented. Um, which, which also says, you know, if, if he's, uh, you know, uh, glamming certain things up for, you know, showing off, like, what is he not telling us? Yeah. I mean, if you want to compare him to Holden Caulfield, Holden Caulfield is one of the most unlikable yeah. literary characters that's ever been put to, to English, English literature. And, and yeah, to compare Alex to him is great. I didn't, that didn't even cross my mind until you've said it now. And that's a really good comparison. Unreliable narratives can be think, fun and entertaining, but no, yeah, we've, we're seeing the unreliable it. narrator. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I just got so excited. Well, something that supports the reliable narrator too is I'm look, I'm going back through the film right now. I don't think there's a scene. I don't think there's a single scene in that film that's not has doesn't have Alex in it and isn't basically told from his perspective. Yeah. I don't think we ever cut away to just the mom and dad just say, Oh, we do the, literally see the mom and dad just having breakfast for like a hot second. But yeah, and we, we also see him the um the uh the other gang ripping the woman's just, clothes yeah, off it's and moments, around though, right it, before right before it's, Alex it's, shows up. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's moments though. It's moments and yeah. again it could just be, you know, him telling the story of what he thinks was going on in there. Oh, before we, he walks in. Listen, officer, we beat up that other gang, but they were trying to rape a girl. She ran away before we got there. Like it still maintains his unreliability. Uh, and man, Kubrick did such a good job in crafting that first act as being so deviant, uh, just over the top, just tits and sex and just violence 
uh, ultra violence, right? And then ultra to violence. then to uh, sedate us with the second act with Alex. Yeah, he from a filmmaking perspective, from a storytelling visual storytelling perspective, the POV of this movie is a masterclass because we do experience every moment of this movie, even when Alex is about to enter the scene through his his lens. Yeah. And it's not a good lens. It's a. It's, it's, and it's, it's, <laughs> even the way he refers to himself, your friendly, reliable narrator, or whatever, yeah, whatever yeah. he says. Trust there's, me. There's a. There's. There is a. I saw the book described as a black comedy. The book described as a black comedy. I'm sure that that, that same kind of tone was trying to be explored in the film. Mm-hmm. Yep. It's it it. Uh, Kubrick was trying to create, according to Malcolm Mandela, uh, a black satirical comedy. That tracks. But much like Fight Club, to go back to that reference, Fight Club is also meant to be satire and a dark comedy. People looked at it and took it as the word. They took it too seriously. They they got the wrong things from it. And I think yeah. Clockwork Orange is a good example for its notoriety, for its fame of people taking the wrong thing from it. Uh, that I think they, I would agree with that, yeah. Um, which, yeah, you know, I, Kubrick probably loved it because he was just probably happy to have people analyzing his art. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm watching this film. And, um, so one thing like with the series is, is, you know, what, who was inspired, who, what was inspired, like what, what came out of this movie? Why is this an essential Simpsons family guy? I think it's pulled in, but I think if you look at the films of Wes Anderson, I think he had a lot of Kubrick in him as far as like his framing and 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 the way his lens is set up, the symmetry of the scenes. Like you look at any Wes Anderson film Mm -hmm. and there's symmetry. There's a lot of left and right movement, which which Kubrick has a lot of as well. Um, I I think completely Tarantino is an obvious one using violence as comedy. Yeah, Uh, basically, like like there was a lot of comedy in this film that was based on horrific violence that was going on. Mm -hmm. Um, And Uh, and actually, let me interject there. Yeah, there is there. There are kind of like sex jokes, too. Yeah. Let me put it this way. There are times in all three acts where there's a joke and the and the punchline of that joke is sometimes kind of an innocent but devious, slightly devious sm act like the the mm-hmm. nurse and the doctor in the third yeah. act I yeah help but think about that Alex is you know, like he's moaning waking and up she's moaning and then they, uh, they pop out uh. the thing that's funny is there was there was um I hit a point with this film there were so many gratuitous breasts in this film that um the, the, and I I think gratuitous is the right word like mm-hmm. it was it was a choice to to yeah. have these things um, filmed the way they were filmed. And I got to a point where I was like, is this like, is this Kubrick do, is this Kubrick's version of a sex comedy? Is this like, (laughs) this is insane. We have, we have very well endowed women all over the place in this film for the sake of jokes, just like you'd see in like a teen comedy. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, this is really, maybe I was conflicted. I, there were, there's probably like five or six moments where they're based. It's basically, like a college, like co- like teen comedy level jokes in there, right? Like anyway. putting the camera at the woman's navel and looking up at her breast and face, like that sort of camera angle is very teen yeah. comedy silly. I don't know if teen comedy, like to compare compared to like a, an eighties sex comedy, I don't know if that if I could say that's where I think he was going. I think we saw so much at the beginning to desensitize us. I think that was the point of of having that much sexual gratuity throughout i see i think it desensitizes so that the the final image right we have alex smiling and slowly like you see his smile dropping and he's this middle distance look and we get a glimpse of what's in his imagination which is this two sexy girls uh surrounded by people watching them wrestle in i don't know powdered sugar or something and it's and, and i think that uh that that there's there is a desensitization throughout so that but I don't know. I, I do see what you're saying where it was funny. It was timed funny to hear Alex moaning from waking up his, from his coma and the nurse having sex with the doctor. Uh, uh, like, uh, I don't uh. think I don't think Kubrick sat down one day and said, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to make a comment on sex comedy. I don't think that was the case at all. But mm-hmm. I was thinking like in his work, because, you know, like the joke is like Kubrick can't make comedies, but but he can 
They're just in this really Doctor Strange glove, very certain point of view style, which is yeah. his style. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And I was thinking, like, this might be this is weird, but this might be Kubrick getting a little randy, honestly. You know what I mean? <laughs> you, so, you would, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I do want to uh, bring up one point, and this is uh, to what you were saying, TC. Like, so if we think of Fight Club and people taking the wrong message, so from about. 1972 until 2000, this film was banned in England. Wow. Because after this film came out and it, it was a box office success, it did really well in both the United States and, and overseas. Um, there were a few copycat uh, copycats who uh, mimicked things from the first act. Oh, in, real, in wait, there were real acts of violence that copycatted acts of violence from the film? Yeah. So, like, there, there were see. rapes where the people would, you know, say that they were inspired by the film <sighs> to do that. It's just um, just whistling, singing in the rain or singing, singing in the rain while they're doing it. Yeah. That's horrible. So, oh. so Kubrick um, had received some death threats. He and his family had to move a couple of times. So he had asked Werner Brothers to pull the movie from being available in, in, in oh, Britain. he asked. And they well, said, even after it was being, it was such a success, they agreed because Kubrick that's, was Kubrick. And, oof. and, um, so until his death in 2000, the film was not available in mm. Britain, not allowed in Britain. Well, I do think there still are countries that don't allow it, oh, but sure. But yeah, there, you know, I, I think Britain is not considered one to like ban many things. So, mm-hmm. Well, I do think to to speak towards the essential quality of this, uh, having yeah. it banned for decades and now making it readily available, this will only be a film that is studied. No, no one's going to seek this out for the hell of it, right? You're not going to get some yeah. seventeen year old kid who's like trying to be edgy and watch this. It's I don't I don't necessarily see that as like a common thing. Making this available now, it's so well beyond. There's so many more. <laughs> awful films that people can watch and be manipulated or inspired by that i think this sort of just becomes oh uh, yeah uh, it, this is a classic piece of cinema but um, i don't necessarily see well, see this getting a, a new burst of fandom right so yeah I, I i mean i think people looking back and appreciating i think people looking back at kubrick and wanting to see his library of work mm-hmm. this would be an important film um along with like the shining and and uh full metal jacket strange love and and yeah so many films um i i I will say with with um uh this film and i i completely lost where i was gonna go with that um because i i had brought the other stuff but um with with this film this was uh now i remember this was a film that really started pushing the mpaa and and the rating system Mm -hmm. so this film was uh, rated X. This is one of the first X-rated films. Kubrick did cut stuff down to get it an R rating, but I see it really pushed because because with the violence, with the sex, um, mm-hmm. there's there's really casual full it. frontal nudity, yeah. and and not in like a in a there is casual full frontal nudity in a v- vo- a gratuitous way. I'll mm-hmm. just say it that mm-hmm. way. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And and so you had this film, and you had another uh, a number of other films too that came out right around the same time, that really started push pushing those boundaries of of what because you're you're coming out of like the 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 system of the fifties and sixties which really tramped down on anything very chaste do, very chaste yeah you couldn't do you know two beds for TV shows you you know you never could show a a, a you know interracial kiss or anything mm-hmm. like that even like um, when we talked about rebel without a cause james dean and the other actor i can't remember his name had had discussed no this character is gay this is a gay yeah. character but we can't overtly do that in the movie because the npa won't allow it yeah it, it it will be yeah and that was from the 50s mm-hmm. so so this film really you know was one of the films that really opened up the doors for a lot of the films um this film is is this film itself is credited a lot with with allowing a lot of the the raunchy comedies that we get in the 80s um mm. a lot of the deeper more violent films that we get in the late 70s and 80s like those really gritty violent films um well, certainly th- this coming out of the vietnam era 
like hot on yeah. the heels of the Vietnam era, the, the, the commentary would simply be, look what we're watching on our televisions in our living room as yep. a family every night. This movie is not as bad as that. And that's why Kubrick and Scorsese, a, lot, a taxi driver specifically, those yep. movies have uh, Brian De Palma violence to them, very uncomfortable, bloody violence because of as a reaction to the world that we were experiencing at the time. Uh, and in a lot of ways we are still experiencing to this day. Um, it was less escapism in a movie like this than it is. Uh, it is more directly commentary, right? Marvel yeah. movies and John wick. Those are, those are escapist movies that reflect yeah. our modern era. Whereas a movie like this is more of that holding up a mirror and saying, no, look, look, look at this. Haha, <laughs> laugh at I, it. I agree with you, TC. I, I think that's well said, actually. It is commentary. It's not escapism at all. There's nothing about this that is escapism. There's nothing about this film that wants, at least I think, doesn't invite the audience to be a part of any of it. Mm -hmm. It's, um, it's, and it's not just, and, and the theme isn't, look how nasty everyone is. The, we've, our main character's technically a murderer. And are and look at how all the people around him are just also nasty because they're feeling they're trying to take care of their own yep. agendas. It's not just that. It's not because that's easy to do. You can just make everyone despicable, and then you've got a movie where everyone's despicable, and that's not interesting. Right. <laughs> Most of the characters around Alex have motivations, and and even if I'm not rooting for them, I can understand where they're coming from, and I think that does make the film thoughtful. I did not enjoy watching this film today. But I do, I do think that it may it, it's a it's a it's a thoughtful film. Yeah. Well, and I was going to ask, you know, before we wrap things up, David, I wanted to ask you, you had said when you were, you know, 20 watching it in college yeah. versus, you know, 20 years later watching it now and just how how you felt. Both of you want to talk about that a little bit. I'm, I'm yeah, sure. I definitely didn't think the first act was cool when I was 20. Not <laughs> at all. Which is good. Which but, is good. Okay. But, you're, sure but you don't you... have a, <laughs> you know, it's not like I was like, oh, that's the cool part. And then it gets boring because he goes to jail. <laughs> it definitely wasn't that. But I, I do remember thinking the film slowed down a bit when he went to jail. And I was getting a little disinterested in my 20s. This, you know, this time around, I got more interested in what was happening for sure. Um, but um, I do think that as you certainly watch more films if your film mm -hmm. if you, the people who are listening to this podcast are are doing it because they are connoisseurs of film they are watching film they're listening you know they they're they're increasing their repertoire of the films that they watch and so for to that point i feel comfortable saying that i think as you do watch more films your um ability to identify your your taste can become a little bit more subtle and i don't mean that the movies need to be more subtle but the nuances so, for example, I mean, I really just I, I, I almost I'm almost sad to kind of go back to this point. But there was in that first act of violence from the opposing gang where they mm -hmm. they basically rip clothes off this this female victim. Um, I remember thinking, gosh, that's awful. But this time around, because I've watched hundreds of more films since 20 years ago, mm -hmm. probably thousands of more films, I'm realizing like. Why are they staying on this medium shot on this woman <laughs> full frontal for so long? This doesn't feed the narrative. This certainly doesn't serve any of the characters in the scene. It's borderline pornographic, quite frankly. And and so just as a film viewer, you get to you, the language. You can you can become a little bit more aware of the language of the film. Mm -hmm. And so that made me very uncomfortable this time around. Where I think when you're a younger viewer. Um, or, or a less seasoned viewer, but you know, everyone's in a 20, it's broader strokes, it's broader strokes. And so you're not seeing some of those details. And I think that was the main difference for me is that I was, it's not that I've become a, a, a an old grouchy man saying, <laughs> no, no, none of this craziness. I think I actually almost the other way, I think I became more aware of some of those, those um, nuances. And that's what actually made me um, technically care for the film less, technically <laughs> care for the film less. I just have to say it. Yeah. I, 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 I think it's I, I do think it's a good point is is as you're looking at films and trying to understand Kubrick is considered a master, a master director, one of the great auteurs mm -hmm. of uh, of the modern era, I guess, because he's still, you know, his uh, eyes, uh, eyes wide shut was mm -hmm. the last film he did. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, asking, you know, what what's motivating this shot? Why am I looking at this shot? Why is he? Why is he using this type of lens in this shot? Um, 
I, I, I think that's that's a more interesting way to look at a film like this. I, I will say that desensi- uh, desensitizing is there now because we've seen it. But in 1971, I'm going to see this film. This is a shocking film to see. Yeah, like, there's yeah. more disturbing uh, scenes and, and things that happened then uh, because, you know, we we haven't had a Tarantino. We haven't had all the films that have come out in the 80s and 90s and, and all that that we've watched over and over. You yeah. haven't seen Fight Club mm-hmm. so many mm-hmm. times. Um, a lot of that stuff in the century. 70s. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. A lot of that stuff, a lot of that kind of like even that kind of roadhouse gore stuff that was happening in the later 70s obviously didn't happen yet. Right. I, I, I don't want to derail us too much, but I must mention this. You, you said the word lens there a few minutes ago. And did, did you guys notice the insane wide angle lenses yes. used for most of this film? Yeah, it was kind of cool. Yeah, it, it does so, help with that perception like that, that almost distorted perception like literal visual distortion perception of reality if, literal, if uh <laughs> yeah so that was uh that, that was uh obviously purposeful but it was also like anytime alex was in frame he was always in the middle mm-hmm. oh, because yeah. he was if you want to if you have a if you have a thing for malcolm adele and want to see him in close-up for at least yeah. an hour <laughs> but but because of the wide because of the wide lens though too which which you know on the sides kind of distorts Alex is always the center frame looking good. He's never distorted Mm -hmm. as an image. Mm -hmm. Well, it also allowed Kubrick to do a few things. There were a few scenes where he was able to do them in a single shot. Yes. But he was getting 90 degree angles. Yeah. So what normally would be a two camera setup for a conversation, he was able to put people on two sides of the frame. And basically because of this crazy wide angle, there were many scenes actually now that I think about it. Um, where there was one scene that really struck me. There was a there was a a kind of a Wes Anderson style shot of um, our. We were just looking at a. We were looking at when when Malcolm McDowell's about to when Alex is about to be brought out to be at, towards the end of Act Two. He's he's going to be shown off as the tests were a success and here's our subject on the stage and all of that. There was a wide shot from the side showing the audience and the stage and then McDowell character coming in from the background Mm -hmm. and there was a tremendous amount of distortion and i realized wait a second we're seeing we're seeing three walls right now (laughs) you know what i mean (laughs) this one angle this one camera and um but it almost made it feel like a play a little bit in that way but i do think the distortion's on purpose i think it's to to help when he walks through that record shop in in the beginning towards the end of act one you're absolutely right alex is dead center and the walls are tight, so we have some really – and it's not fisheye. It doesn't look like a no, skateboard no. video. Somehow the lines are still <laughs> kind of parallel, but um, it really helps you feel like the universe hit – and Alex's perception – I mean I guess it goes two ways. I guess it yeah. makes him the center of the universe. Mm-hmm. And then also it kind of shows how his reality doesn't – it gets quite distorted as it moves away from him because he's probably a sociopathic narcissist. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. A- absolutely. And, and I and – I, I love that Kubrick went with that and and I think it worked like when you when you watch a film and and just thinking about it and 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 thinking of that choice um he said like there's yeah lots of close ups and again it goes back to that that narrative right like who's telling us a story it's Alex mm-hmm. so to your point David like yeah his in his view he's not distorted the world is distorted around him so yeah he's a sociopath he's <laughs> he's uh He's a, a, a terrible person. And, and without that last chapter of the book added to this, we'll never get it. Maybe that's what we can do. We can make that film. We'll make the, <laughs> the fan edit. Clockwork well, the special Orange, edition. the last chapter. Oh, jeez. <laughs> last chapter is good. Yeah, we'll get that in. We'll get that in. All right. So big question. TC, I'll start with you. Mm-hmm. Is this an essential film? I don't think so. I th- I do feel that if this if you are rooted in if you have a love for Tarantino if you have a a, a love for David Fincher movies um I I don't think Tarantino and Fincher have things to say like this movie sa- has to say I think visually they have a lot of they're drawing a lot of inspiration but I don't think Tarantino yeah. or Fincher ever have anything that's not truly fair Fight Club definitely has like a, a message so that it's in there the movie I'd compare this most to is American Psycho. The uh, yes. Brett, Easton, Brett Easton Ellis book is very similar to this, and the movie is very similar to this movie. It's got 
where, where, where Clockwork, a Clockwork Orange has the sheen or the non-sheen of a 70s film, American Psycho has the sheen of an, it's made in the 90s, but set in, has an 80s look to it. But it's a unreliable narrator, sociopathic narcissist to use David's term. But is a Clockwork Orange an essential? No, I don't think it is. I, it, of Kubrick's library of the dozen or so films I've seen from him, I don't even know if I've seen a dozen, but I've seen a handful of Kubrick. I don't think this is his best. Uh, and I don't I don't feel like you're missing out by seeing this, or by not seeing this, right? Like there are certain movies I'll see like older, ver- Officer and a Gentleman is a great example of seeing it and then getting all these pop culture references, getting the Simpsons references, mm-hmm. uh, getting the getting an Ace Ventura joke 25 years after the fact, like I've got nowhere else to go. Like, oh, that that was I get why Officer and Gentleman was ingrained in pop culture that way. I get the 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 romantic, the romantic nature. Of, yeah, yeah. But I don't feel like there's enough in Clockwork Orange that you don't already have have absorbed from the zeitgeist that you need to see this film. So I say no, not an essential. What would what would you say, David? Do you, you can disagree with me. I don't mind. <laughs> no, I actually I think I do agree with everything TC said, but I do think it's kind of I'm going to pivot it just a touch. I see, so literally the word essential means like the things you must see the yep. the top of it all. I don't think it is it certainly isn't for me it's it's not a film i need to see again i do think it has things to say i love that you mentioned that tc i think this film says a lot more than a lot of films do and so for those reasons i feel like it's like a deep cut Mm. essential Mm -hmm. it's kind of like uh it's not a deep cut you know it's like after you've you've gone through all the essentials and you're going into some of the deeper well like the deep cuts like it's like when you're listening to a new musician Mm -hmm. you're listening to their hits and those are maybe the essentials and maybe there's a few that are in there that are also essentials because they weren't hits but they're just critical to the artist's path and then you start grabbing some deep cuts i think this is in that spectrum if you're going to watch five stanley kubrick films this probably doesn't need to be in that five but if you're well versed with kubrick and and you want it to be a part of your if you want it to inform your palette of film viewing, I kind of think it's, I think, so I don't want to say it's, I don't want to say it's not essential, but I think it technically is not essential. So that's, I'm not trying to give you a non-answer, but do you see where I'm going with this? <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I, I, I will disagree. So, so I, I, I'm, I'll start off by saying I found this film disturbing. I yeah. feel that this is not a film that I need to watch again. Um, I, you know, I wouldn't say that I like the film. However, I do feel that for a lot of, a lot of what this film established, um, and, and where we are in film today, I I think today's films a, a lot. And you mentioned Fincher, you mentioned Tarantino, we talked about Wes Anderson, they're watching this film and learning. This is the film that they watched and they said, we need to make a film. Um, so in, in that sense, I feel it is essential because there were other Kubrick films, but I, I, I don't feel that many, maybe outside of, of one or two of them, have the, had the uh, cultural impact that this sure. film did. Sure, yeah. Um, so in, you know, that's a really... In, in yeah, those that's senses, really like, that's point, why I, I think this is an essential film. Um, <clears throat> you know, it, it is, you know, if you, if you look at, at Kubrick as as a as a director and, can, you know, he's one of the top directors ever. This is one of his top grossing films of all time. Mm-hmm. Mm. I think that I speaks that. more to the audience than, <laughs> than yeah. the film, the film itself. <laughs> I had a slightly disturbing experience earlier today. I was chatting with a with a friend and I said, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to go. um I have to go. I'm doing a podcast tonight and we're going to talk about Clockwork Orange. And I got to go watch it now. You know, um, I was like, you know, leaving a meeting from this morning. Mm-hmm. And this friend goes, <laughs> this friend goes, oh, yeah, love the first half. Second half, totally boring. And I was like, oh, <laughs> oh I don't know about this person anymore. <laughs> um, and I'm not going to I don't want to place any judgment. But it, like, it's like I feel like if you go into it and you. And I think it is essential to film history. Mm-hmm. If yeah. you go into it and you think about 
that it's maybe more of a comment on the different societies and the different organizations that deal with this definitive, I'll, I'll say, threat of this human. Um, I think there is something to take from that for sure. And, and you know, too, if if you're doing if you're watching Malcolm McDowell films, that's all you watch. Sure. <laughs> you you have to watch nowadays. It's definitely McDowell's, the Malcolm McDowell essentials. Yeah. Yes. Now, nowadays, Malcolm McDowell shows up in something and I go, oh, no, this is probably gonna I know. Be bad. <laughs> I think I think what, what he did like this and Caligula and I don't know what else. What a what a horny he's fella. He's got a, a very, very uh, weird film. Like Star Trek the, Generations, man. <laughs> all the films he's been in. So, all right. Any any final thoughts that either of you want to share as we wrap up? No, this is great. I'm I'm glad to have finally seen this. I am I am glad I watched this. I don't want to. I'm not disappointed that I watched it. But yeah, like you guys said, this isn't one I'm going to watch again. And I it helps me. It does help fill in some gaps of that cinematic knowledge that I want and I'll be able to speak more eloquently about this when it comes up again in the future. So I'm, I'm grateful to have, have watched this. So good, good pick. I think you picked it, Schulze. No, that, no, no, you know, this was, this was your, this pick. me. Good job, me. Yeah. All right. This was your pick. <laughs> Wait, is it like, do you build a list and then you fill the, fill out the, fill, fulfill the yeah. list or something? Is that, yeah, we, we have a list of films and, and as we run into some that we run it, you know, it's like, Hey, let's, let's, uh, let's add that to the list. And we yeah. try not to get any films that were made, before like 75 or so yeah. or made made after 75 i should say yeah like essentially once we hit the blockbuster era of of jaws and superman and star wars like oh, those yeah. that's the modern era of film and there are definitely some legendary films within that category it's that it's that earlier era of cinema that we're we're trying to to look at with this series and uh, i'm excited in to- other words if you're a film viewer if you're a film viewer now um What's worth going back and, and to inform right. your your film history? Right, yep. right. Oh, I love it. I like that. Yep. Um, my closing comment is: I didn't know when I said yes to being on this episode um, because I actually missed you invited me to be on your first episode, yeah. and I was really excited about that. But the schedules didn't align, and so when you said, "Well, how about the second episode?" I just said yes, and I didn't know what the film would be. And then I got a, a message saying, "Okay, great, we're doing Clockwork Orange," and I was like, "Okay, here we go." <laughs> <laughs> But I'm happy I had the experience. I'm very grateful for this conversation. It definitely helps me um, think about the film in, in a in a in a couple couple new ways and uh, with a broader scope. Because about an hour into the film this afternoon, I was like, I hate it. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I don't like it. I don't like any of this. But you know, the thing is, like, um, boring people don't like things. That's what, what I always say. If you simply say, I don't like, it, I don't like it, that's boring. There's nothing to be said there. If if you don't like something. And I, I didn't fully dislike this film. There were parts that I did like about it. And I think I spoke to those in this episode. But like, how can you still be critical? How can you identify what you do yep. and don't like once you don't like something? But I, I will be honest, an hour in, I didn't have a lot of answers to that question <laughs> today. <laughs> no, no, it was it was it was a very <laughs> tough film to watch. And just just, you know, seeing the meme of the eyes being held open versus seeing the full scene mm-hmm. with the eyes being forced open. It's it's very hard to watch. It's mm. very uncomfortable. But I think that's part of the point. Yeah. Yeah. We yeah. wanted to make you uncomfortable. <laughs> well, so. what do we do? You have the next film picked for the series. Do you know what we're doing next? I don't think we've discussed it. Well, we haven't discussed it yet. So okay. um, well, to we, TBD. We can, I, uh, yeah, I I have a thought. I could share the thought. What do you think? I I think we go back to uh, Scarface. Uh, the, now you're talking the original Scarface, the the original Scarface, the Howard Hughes Scarface. Yes, another Howard violent movie. <laughs> I, I I'd be down to watch that. I, that that would be an. Inter- I might watch the. The Al Pacino one, the Brian De Palma one, as well, just to be able to speak to it as well. There you go. We're gonna do Scarface, folks. Okay. <laughs> cool. That's that's. I our look next forward film. to listening to that episode. And if and if ever works that I can I can join you again in in you know later on down in the season, I'd be really happy to do so. If you didn't, if you don't mind, I'm inviting myself yeah. to you. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And <laughs> and actually, our our next show that I I do will be part of the uh, comedy series, and and you can join on that one as well. Perhaps that could be cool. <laughs> that could be cool. In a in a couple of weeks here, I go back to school, and it gets very very busy again. But anyway. Yep. We can talk about that off mic. Yeah. So, uh, well, thank you, everyone, for listening. Um, 
again, there, there's a, a just an immense library of different podcasts that you can. If you just came here for 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 this one, well, thank you. I'm guessing that you've listened to others that are part of the the six five group. Um, thank you. Check out our other podcasts. Check out all the other podcasts on six five media. There's some awesome ones of all different things, not just movies, but. Uh, Basically, anything that you can uh, want to hear things about, you can hear about in here. <laughs> yeah, if I may, we've got so we've got yes. another Zelda podcast, which is a show that I do with another person. TC does Studio Demands It. That's right. Um, there's, I think, around the time that this episode is going to air, I think we'll also have a new show. It's kind of it's kind of Filmological Society's sibling show, and it's called Fan Fiction. And Dan McCoy uh, is going to be doing that one, where they're going to talk about certain fandoms and, and, and interpret them in certain ways. Anyways. Um, also we have um, two other video game podcasts that are doing quite well right now called turn by turn, which is a role-playing game show. And another one, a, t- a show simply called top five Nintendo. Top and five. It's, it's these two guys over in the East and they basically, they build top five, top 10 lists of their favorite Nintendo things, which when I first heard about the idea, I was like, okay, well, I mean, that seems kind of straightforward, but the truth is it really becomes an excuse to have really nice um, nostalgic conversations about things is really <laughs> what it ends up doing. So um, if people have come from one of those shows over here, awesome. You, you have much in store with Filmological Society. And if you're finding Filmological Society, and you want to go check out those shows, do it, do it, <laughs> do it. <laughs> and, uh, um, you know, David, we, we do have a thing here. Once you join our show for as a guest, you are part of the Filmological Society now. So welcome. Oh, that's right. I forgot about this. Yeah, yeah you welcome. you are you are you are part of us now. Anyone that joins us is part of the society. You're in. <laughs> I'm in. We'll teach you the handshake uh, next are, time. Next time we're all in the room yep. together. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> yep. Uh, the dues you can just send those to me, Venmo or whatever. That's fine. Mm. We'll, Copy we'll, that. We'll Copy take that. I'll yeah, take it out of your Facebook ad budget. <laughs> that sounds good. That sounds good. <laughs> Probably about the same. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, everybody. Uh, this has been a, a fun show. So thank you, TC and David, for joining for uh, joining today. This is uh, always fun. Yeah. Uh, so I think thank the so vote much, was that this uh, probably isn't essential. Yeah, I think that's where, where the what? vote went. Probably not. Yeah, so. I think I think I would have to lean towards it not being but with a, yeah. with an honorable mention of it being a deep cut. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so that's where we ended with this one. This was the first non-essential <laughs> film that we've done on this then (laughs) so thank you everybody thank you chris see you next time thank you again for listening to the film illogical society if you'd like to listen to similar podcasts please check out six five media on stitcher itunes and facebook or check out redacted media on facebook or youtube